Welcome to the June webinar. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, two recent settlements that my firm has had along with a case that has been, uh, for better or worse, uh, getting a lot of press attention lately because it's tied to uh, and featured in America's number one podcast, I guess. Um, that podcast is called Betrayal. Uh, we'll wrap up with that and tell you the story of our client and why the heck they would do a podcast and um, how I fit in and all that stuff. But we'll end with that. In the meantime, we're going to start by talking about uh, two cases that my firm recently settled. Um, these were two cases that settled for $1.5 million and $1 million. Both were auto accident cases. Um, and the first one we'll talk about is a $1.5 million settlement that was actually above the policy limits and settled right before trial. Uh, the second one is a trucking case, which settled for $1 million at mediation. Um, I'm excited to talk about these two cases because they, they have some issues that come up in a lot of cases. Uh, the issues like property damage or lack thereof, at least visible property damage. Um, issues like, uh, is your client better? Is she uh, or he continuing to be in pain? Or if not, how do you quantify those damages? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in... Uh, Alan Stagmeyer from my office. Alan's going to give us the rundown on some of these cases. He was the primary day-to-day -day person who was responsible for these cases. Um, and there's Alan with, who needs something behind his wall at some point, but uh, we'll get there. Alan, you hear me okay? I can. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, everybody. All right. Alan uh, is like four offices away um, from me right down the hall but uh, does not have the obvious same setup. He doesn't have Maria back here with, with her helmet on, but uh, we'll get by. So Alan, talk to me about, um, well, let's talk about the first case, which is, and I'm going to use a name because it's we can, um, which is nice. And that's why I'm glad we can kind of talk freely about this first one. Um, we'll just call it the Simmons case. Talk to me about um, the beginnings of that case when it comes into you what, what do you learn about it and what makes you think that it has potential? Well, that case was a young lady in her early 20s. And uh, when I first got the case, it had been through pre-suit and the liability insurer State Farm uh, had offered $250,000 on a cervical disc replacement uh, for her. And she still had ongoing symptoms. And because it was a surgery, a young person, particularly in the neck, um, you know, that's a significant case that I think uh, deserves significant attention. Um, the total policy available uh, from the underlying layer in the excess was 1.25. Um, and so at the point that I got it, they'd offer 250. They said, we think that's fair. So I filed suit. I think they were probably a little bit emboldened by the fact that there's no property damage whatsoever to the defendant's vehicle. Uh, oh, there's, 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 <laughs> ah, hold on, let, let me show everybody. So okay. well, as I do this, why don't you tell everyone how the crash happened about, you know, Simmons pulling out of the publics and all that good stuff. Yeah, so Natasha was trying to make a right sort of, she got to the exit uh, on Peachtree Industrial coming out of a Publix parking lot. And uh, as she was trying to exit, it was kind of one of those exits where it has a dedicated lane where if you're turning right, which is, you know, one of the ways you could turn, the other is to sort of come to a straight and then make a left uh, sort of to her left and behind her. She's trying to exit, but because the road is busy, she's actually got to do this as she's trying to get on the road. And um, as she's waiting to merge there, she gets hit from behind by the defense. And whose car are we looking at right here? So this is the front of the defendant's vehicle. It was never repaired. Uh, there was never a property damage estimate done. I mean, I knew from looking at this photo that the property damage was going to be a focus of the case. Yeah. So uh, let's show, I've got Natasha's car as well. This is the back. Yes. And, um, you know, cars these days, I mean, thankfully are you know, manufactured and designed in a way that, you know, has, they have crash zones and crumple zones and things like that. And so these days, 
you know, you can get hit with a decent impact, but from the outside, it doesn't really look that significant. And I think, you know, in a lot of property damage photos, some insurance companies are, you know, I don't know, maybe pretty widely about how they, they take the photos. A lot of times the photos don't really show a whole lot. Um, These don't. These no, certainly don't. No, it doesn't, look, <laughs> it doesn't look like a big impact. And, you know, the facts of how it happened kind of tells us that, uh, it, you know, it wasn't a huge impact. But I think... How, how fast, uh, based on the testimony, and I, I know the answer here, but how fast was, do you think the defendant was driving when the well, defendant was pulling out of the shopping center so she's at a dead stop. And, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll do the demonstration here. I, I've, I've seen you do it enough. So the defendant is sitting there and she's about to pull out. She's, there's a car in front of her, which is our client. And she's getting in this, this right like accelerator lane, merge lane to get onto Peachtree Industrial. And she's looking left, left to see what cars are coming. Yeah. And she says she looks, sees no cars, starts to accelerate, looks again, sees no cars and hits the car in front of her, which is our client. She said Natasha started to pull forward. And at that point, she starts looking behind her. But what kind of was apparent in the defendant's deposition testimony is that the defendant was trying to kind of get not only merged, but get over a couple of lanes because at the next light down, which is, you know, less than a quarter mile away, she's going to get and try to make a U-turn. And uh, so she's trying to punch it really I mean when you're really thinking about the fundamental truth of how the crash happened what she's really telling us is she's trying to find that little gap in traffic punch it so that she can get in there and then get all the way across almost immediately and so um so how fast do you that in your in your opinion how fast was everybody going to cause this you know this kind of damage well the defendant said in her deposition that she's 100% certain she was doing less than five miles an hour. And that seems like something that the defense lawyer probably prepared her to say, you know, uh, based on what we know about um, biomechanics and how biomechanist engineers sort of evaluate those things. There's a whole body of literature about impacts being less than five miles an hour. Um, and I think Natasha said she never saw her before the impact. She saw her creeping up behind, but never actually, you know, saw her speeding up to hit her. So she didn't know. So we're really basically left with uh, what the what the defendant said, and then the actual property damage. Oops, I'm clicking on. Um, yeah. So I mean, at a minimum, right? This is this is certainly a low speed, a low speed crash, right? I mean, I think the way the defendant was describing it led me to believe that it wasn't just five miles an hour, but I knew we had an uphill battle given the photos and her testimony. Yeah, and here's, I, I pulled up the police report. You can see this, right? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, not the best drawing here, but this would be the defendant, this would be our client, and they're pulling out of this, this public shopping center. They're going up on the piece of paper, um, going up and then turning right, and they're trying to get, excel they're trying to accelerate. We know the defendant, is actually trying to get into this lane over here, That's way right. over here. So when you said she had to punch it, you know, she had to get all across all three into four lanes. Um, but still, I mean, you know, she wasn't terribly far behind our client in terms of distance, and you can only speed up so much. So, um, so we've talked about the problem of property damage and speed. I, I thought that that you did some really good things in order to combat that. Um, talk to us about. Uh, the deposition of the uh, of the property damage adjuster, and then how you framed what the property damage was. Meaning, what did you call it as opposed to, you know, just some some paint on on a on a bumper? <laughs> so, you know, when you uh, when you look at the actual property damage estimate, uh, I think, you know, you can as a lawyer determine some things about how significant the impact was and whether there was hidden damage that goes beyond just the cosmetic damage that you can see uh, on the outside. And so, you know, in this property damage estimate, I mean, the thing you're really looking for is something that says set up and pull, floor pull, measure and pull, things like that. It used to be that the way they would describe it is, you know, put it on the frame rack or put it on the rack and uh, that was to sort of straighten out body damage. 
Um, a lot of vehicles these days are actually unibody style, which means that, and I learned this in the property damage appraiser's deposition, uh, that it's actually different sections of the vehicle that are welded together during the manufacturer. And so, uh, you know, for instance, the rear unibody would be the rear, maybe third of the vehicle, to the best of my recollection. And so if you have significant enough body damage, they'll cut the rear of the unibody off and weld a new lower back third onto the body of the vehicle. But if the back of the unibody is deformed, but maybe not, you know, to such a severe extent, it needs to be cut off, then they'll put time and an estimate, you know, line item in the estimate there to put it on the frame rack. They anchor it down with chains and then use, you know, sort of hydraulics to bend the unibody of the vehicle back into place. And so that's really an impressive sounding kind of thing. Yeah. So if you see it on the property damage estimate, floor setup, floor pull, this one was not significant enough to where they needed to actually measure. And then, but you know, there's even an additional layer where they need to measure setup and pull. And I mean, you can see on here, the time they've allotted is like six and a half hours or no, yeah, five and a half hours. Yeah, right here. Is. Yeah, the four plus the 1.5, the floor set up and pull are hours of labor. So it's five and a half hours for them to hook it up to the frame machine, bend the unibody back in place. And so, you know, look, um, if you, you and I had I, you and I had a big discussion debate about what we were going to call this damage, you know, leading up and we'll get to, to the leading up to the trial and the settlement. But, um, you know, I was kind of shrugging and saying calling it frame damage. Um, but I know you were apprehensive about doing that just because, you know, the frame, it depends on how you define frame, right? I yeah. Mean, it's, yeah. And I, you know, I guess one of the things I'm always thinking in the back of my mind about is I don't really want to give a defense lawyer an opening in opening. If we say something like frame damage, you get up and say, well, that's not true. You know, that's not true. And the property damage appraiser is going to tell you that, or that's not accurate. And he's, you know, kind of make it seem like maybe we're overstating it. So if anything, I want to be a little bit understated. And even if it's something that we need to explain a little bit later, I knew the property damage appraiser guy would do it. So I just basically said, look, technically it's unibody damage. And I think, you know, we can still say that, you know, they had to put it on the rack and they had to, you know, move the, the, the you know, bend the unibody back into place because of the damage. And I still think, you know, that was... I think the right call. <laughs> we didn't get yeah. to that point, but well, we yeah we, we we never had to figure it out. But um, I thought the property damage, deposing the property damage adjuster was really good. Uh, it was a really good idea because it 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 gives a a non party, an unbiased person who's who doesn't really, I mean, why what benefit or 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 you know uh, uh, bias does he have one way or another? He's just saying, yeah, here's what the estimate says, and here's what it means. And I think that gets overlooked a lot by people, what the estimate actually means. And so technically, he actually wasn't the PD adjuster employee. Right, yeah, he was, yeah, he was, he's the guy who works for whatever Hendrick Chevrolet, right. uh, and they have a dedicated guy there who comes in and, you know, basically they'll look at it initially, say, hey, we think this is, it's going to take this amount of money to fix it. He sends that estimate off to the insurance company. So he is kind of an independent guy. I mean, you know, he wants to make sure Hendrick Chevrolet is getting paid for all the time and materials are going to put into it. So he's going to make sure the estimate is accurate. Uh, and this guy had been doing property damage appraisal. He was the property damage appraiser employed by uh, Hendrick Chevrolet. But sometimes, you know, insurance companies have independent property damage adjusters and they'll retain them and send them over. Some insurance companies do it that way. But at any rate, so taking that guy's deposition, I mean, he was experienced in property damage appraisal, having him walk through what he does, how he, you know, his methodology for doing that. And then having him, I think importantly, a lot of times the photos that we get, you can't really make heads or tails of it unless you really know what you're looking at. I don't, you know, I don't really know that much about cars. So, you know, taking the photos, taking the estimate, going and taking the guy's deposition and having him explain all the terms and what they meant and what they had to do. Really, we were able to explain that the impact was significant enough to go through the bumper cover, through the impact absorber, damage the impact bar, go all the way to the core of the car, the unibody, and damage that. And they had to put it on the frame rack and straighten it out. And that was one of the first deposit. I took the defendant's deposition, and then I went to North Carolina and took the property damage appraiser's definite, uh, deposition. And he, he basically said, look, I think it was a moderate impact. Well, that, at that point, 
I think, sort of headed off a potential uh, retainer. I mean, they could still retain a biomechanical engineer to do this thing, but honestly, I don't know if it's going to get that much traction with, you know, the jury knowing that it went all the way to the core of the car and you couldn't just rely on photos to say nobody could be injured in that. Well, let's just pretty quickly here talk about the liability side. Um, there was a little interesting twist here where um, it seemed to me the, the defense lawyers were admitting that uh, that the defendant caused the crash, but the defendant herself wasn't actually admitting that. Tell, well, tell me about that. So in, you know, uh, it was a, a frequent flyer state farm defense firm and they, you know, denied negligence in the answer. Um, in the deposition of my recollection, I think I sent requests for admissions. They still denied it. And then in the deposition of the defendant, she said, um, my recollection of it, I think she said she may have been, or that she wasn't paying attention to the road ahead because she was looking backwards, but she still refused to admit that that was, yeah. you know, she said it was our client's fault for being in front of her. <laughs> that's right. And, and she said, and I said, well, look, I mean, do you think that if you're trying to merge on the highway and somebody's not merging as fast as you want them to, you can just run into them from behind. And she's like, well, she didn't go. I thought she was going to go. And I mean, obviously she has a responsibility to make sure that she's keeping a proper lookout. And so the key was the defendant had admitted the underlying facts, you know, that she wasn't paying attention to the road ahead, that she was looking over her shoulder backwards when she accelerated. Then she felt impact and looked forward. And she said her initial thought was, oh, I thought somebody hit me. Well, I mean, obviously the facts, the underlying facts are that she was not paying attention and was, you know, at fault, but the defendant refused to admit it. And it's basically just her interpretation of those facts, her opinion, her lay opinion that she wasn't at fault, but that's not really what's relevant. I mean, what, what we're really looking for is what the underlying facts are. So the defense lawyer was kind of piggybacking on that and they were just refusing to admit that, you know, she had any fault. I remember what happened. We sent, uh, I sent RFAs. They technically blew the time yeah. to respond to the RFAs. I filed a motion for summary judgment. They filed a motion, you know, to be allowed to withdraw it. And the key is, look, this is really important. When you, you know, admit something in a request for admissions, whether it's because you didn't respond in time or whether you just initially admitted it, the, the burden then shifts to the defense to, to withdraw it, but they have to put forth competent evidence that shows there's a genuine dispute. So in other words, it's not just enough that they, they want to you know, try this issue or that they just disagree about the yeah. inference that should be drawn from the facts. They've got to show that they have, yeah, something they gotta, to hang right. head on. They got to show it's a genuine dispute. So that, that's a powerful thing to shift the burden to the defense because most of the time, especially in a rear end collision, they just, you know, they want to kind of, throw up a bunch of things and try to create some doubt, but that's not enough. So then the burden shifted. They filed a motion to withdraw. We went into the hearing and I filed, I, I still, my argument was, look, even if you allow them to withdraw it, the, the, the denial really doesn't matter because the underlying facts are that the defendant tells us she's not paying attention when she accelerates and hits the defendant. Well, so and, the judge, and, no, and, no, and no judge wants to, wants to, um, to, decide liability based on on a missed deadline and i i remember um on on the briefing of that we we were careful to tell the judge hey you're in the clear here because whether the rfas are admitted or denied the the facts are that this woman caused the crash and there's really no dispute about that other than her saying yeah but i don't think i did anything wrong even though she got done saying you know the three sentences before you know, yeah, I did something wrong and here's exactly what I did wrong. I mean, she spelt it out, but then came to the wrong conclusion. Right, exactly. And so, yeah. you know, the judge allowed them to withdraw the admissions, then granted by motion for summary judgment anyway, and found the defendant a hundred percent at fault uh, for the collision. And so, you know, I think, I think that's a really good lesson for everybody. When you, when you have an important decision before a judge, wh whether it's you know the result of a missed deadline, whether it's just a summary judgment, whether it's an expert, something involving experts, you need to make the judge feel comfortable that their decision um, is backed by the law, certainly, but also that it just feels right. Um, you know, especially with sanctions. You know, judges don't want to sanction people. They don't want to sanction lawyers. They don't want to sanction parties because 
depending on what the sanction actually is, that can result in a huge shift of, of, of the case of, of whether, you know, who's it responsible, what evidence you can put in or whatever it is. I, I think that when you're drafting important motions like that, you need to give the judge a holistic view of what's going on and tell them it's okay. You're getting to the right result. Um, and this is what should happen. And I think that's really important to do unless you're going to have a judge who's very apprehensive about going the full, you know, the full mile for you. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think that's true. I think if a judge is looking at a situation and they feel like that the grounds for really truly granting it are just a missed deadline or sort of this ticky tack thing, they're probably going to allow them to do it because they want to see the case, you know, tried on its merits. But if on its merits, really, you know, the defendant is hundred percent at fault, then, you know, I think, uh, judges would like to see cases tried truly on what the real disputes are. And I think, you know, we as plaintiff's lawyers, sometimes we say, hey, let's just leave it all up to the jury and we trust them to find the right, you know, result. I mean, look, defense lawyers make a living off creating confusion. And so, I mean, look, I think if you've got the facts and the law in your favor, move for summary judgment, you know, cut off their routes of escape, use the same thing, motions and limine, cut off their routes of escape, and, uh, you know, I think you'll find that your case values go up dramatically when you do that. Yeah, and I've talked about it on here before. I mean, we have we as a firm have have started drafting and filing more motions for summary judgment um, or, or motions for partial su summary judgment, whether it's on certain uh, whether it's on, on you know, negligence, whether it's on um, certain causation or damages. I mean, we've we've really tried to do that because it it, it takes away, like you said, a lot of escape routes, a lot of escape hatches. And it, I think it drastically improves the settlement value during the case because, you know, an adjuster or a defense lawyer is going through their checklist and says, shit, I'm, I'm not going to be able to argue that at trial. I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm not going to be able to do that. Even if they don't, even if they really don't have, you know, a great leg to stand on on whatever issue it is, it at least removes it completely from their frame of mind. And it, I think it makes it an easier case to settle for them because they can say to their adjuster, to their client, whoever it is, hey, look, you know, there's a duty, there's a breach, there's cause, we're only at damages here. Is this really a case we want to try? Um, you know, selfishly, I, I think it, uh, like on this case, and let's talk about the settlement and how it happened. Um, you know, I remember when we settled this case or sitting in the conference room down here, our client is here. We, we are prepping on a Friday afternoon for the Monday trial. Time certain. What's that? Time certain trial. Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, trial is Monday morning. Our client has flown in from Texas, uh, and we are we are with her on Friday afternoon and then into early Friday evening. Um, and the phone is ringing, right? We get the phone call. It's, hey, do you, you, you thinking about settling this case? No, not really. <laughs> and I, I, I remember we made an offer um, and, and I think I'm right about this. We made a $2 million offer. Um, we had previously made a policy limits to ban. Um, it was rejected. So when we made a, 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 an offer that, you know, is well above the policy limits, I don't think you and I thought that there'd be any traction. You know, this is like noon, noon on Friday. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then next thing you know, we get the call back. And I think their offer was 750 out of the gate, which they had never been anywhere near even that. Um, Back and forth, we went to 175, they went to a million, and uh, what one they went to 125. And we actually, I remember I told Mike Warner this, and he told me I was a lunatic. They went, they offered us 1.25 at what, about five o'clock in the afternoon? The policy limits, yeah. Yeah, which so they offered the 1.25 million dollar policy limits. I should probably pause. Um, tell everybody about her injuries, medical bills, um, and, and I think what helped bring the damages up in this case is her ongoing treatment. So I'll pause yeah. right here and we'll get back to the settlement. So, I mean, right after the crash, her mom took her to an urgent care uh, and then there was no treatment for like three weeks. Uh, and so, but then, you know, she was treating with orthopedists, got, uh, you know, injections, physical therapy, that stuff didn't help. Uh, she was treating with an orthopedist who wasn't an orthopedic surgeon. And he basically said, look, you know, you're getting temporary relief from the injections, but I can't do anything else to help you. Uh, and so she went and saw an orthopedic surgeon who said, look, I mean, for about a year now, you've tried everything. It didn't work. Uh, so uh, he recommended a two-level disc replacement, 
And she did that and got, you know, relief from a lot of the radiating symptoms, but a lot of her uh, neck pain and even some of the radiating symptoms ended up coming back after that. Total medical bills were about 198,000, something like that. Um, and I mean, all, all in all, pretty reasonable for injections plus cervical surgery. I know defense lawyers probably disagree with that. But, uh, and importantly, after the surgery, she had still continued to periodically follow up with a primary care doctor, even after she moved out to Texas. And I think that was a really important thing in the case, because I think a lot of plaintiffs, you know, even if they still have symptoms, they've been through surgery, they've done the physical therapy, and then they just kind of stop going to the doctor. I mean, the defense likes to argue that if you stop going to the doctor, it means because you're better, right? Um, yeah. but, but I, but I'll also, you know, I think that, you know, clearly there are a section of patients, a subset of patients who have been through everything and they're just tired of going to the doctor. I mean, you know, people have to get on with their lives, go to work. They have, you know, she didn't have a family, but some people have family responsibilities. And if you've got kids and all that, you've got to work. I mean, people don't have the luxury of taking off a bunch of time to go to a bunch of physical therapy visits. I mean, it is really, you know, an interference with your everyday life. So she had been going to primary care doctor visits, getting trigger point injections, and that continued for four years, yeah. five and, and, years. And, and that is the best way to show an ongoing injury. I mean, that it cannot be, I mean, it can be disputed. It is all the time, but I, I really think it's very, very difficult for the defense to claim that someone doesn't have an ongoing injury when they are treating constantly. Right. And on the flip side, if someone isn't treating, and, and I say constantly, I mean, she was going for two injections a year, um, something like Certain that. Points. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. Um, on the flip side, if your client is not going to treat, you know, you need to have some sort of explanation why. And the explanation, you know, needs to be very reasonable and very logical. You know, I, I, so I, I think you have to address that head on. So we're sitting, you know, we're sitting in the conference room, I don't know, 5 6 o'clock, and they offer the policy limits. Uh, I remember that we thought that <laughs> we thought that it would uh, probably be malpractice if we didn't take the policy limits at some point. <laughs> um, but and, and I'll, I'll share everybody with this. Thankfully, the lawyer who offered that this money is, uh, is has since retired or stepped away from the practice of law. So, you know, I don't I don't think he's going to be listening to my thoughts right now, but I'll just really share it. The reason we said no to the policy limits one point two five and then we went back at one point five million dollars was because we thought we could. It just felt like from the negotiations, I mean, it, it truly it felt like there was more money to get. Um, I thought it was important that when they offered the policy limits, they didn't say this was a take it or leave it. They weren't strong about that offer. And, you know, I remember walking into our, we, we stepped outside to talk and then we walked back into the conference room and we've got to tell our client that our recommendation is to not take the most amount of money that is can be guaranteed to her. Um, but you know, we had a backup and our backup was we had no problem saying, you know what, you know, we will accept the 1.25 um, at some point, right? We were willing to fall back and take it, um, even if that meant waiting till Monday morning uh, and, and giving everyone the chance to think about it. But it's really, really hard in this scenario with this. You got less than $200,000 in medical bills. Um, you've got, you know, really poor, really light property damage. Um, you've got uh, you know, the defendant, although her story didn't make any sense, she was a, a, a nice lady, you know, no, nobody wanted to punish her. She was, you know, an older lady who, you know, was a bad driver, <laughs> kind of a, kind of a little bit of a jerk, but you know, yeah, she was kind of a jerk, but yeah, it didn't come across I mean, necessarily in the deposition transcript, you know, and who knows, she would have been so prepped by the time trial rolled around that, you know, people would have thought that, you know, she was teaching Sunday school class. So I, I think the takeaway that that I kind of took from from what we did, and and I wish I I wish the the truth was I I had this plan going into the offers. I don't know if we necessarily did, or at least if it was kind of this fleshed out. But you know, if you are in kind of like free money, if you're in found money, where your case value is your offer is somewhere in the case value that you think is appropriate, but you're still trying to get more, make sure that you have a fallback and make sure that you're not. You know, we didn't go and, and say, you know, it's 1.5, take it or leave it, because we didn't want to do that either. Um, so, you know, make sure that you, you know, have that fallback. We told our client that it is possible that when we 
reject the $1.25 million policy limits demand or offer, that that may not be back on the table, but you know, I, 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 we didn't see any reason why they would take it off, but we did tell her about that risk, but we told her we thought it was a risk worth taking because it just really felt like, and I wish I had a better explanation, but it really, really felt like the negotiation was not done when they offered that and they were willing to go above it and, and come to find out they were. Um, so, all right, let's switch gears here and let's talk about another case where we, we in, in all candor, can't be extremely uh, uh, forthcoming about everything. So I'm going to show some things here, but let's be careful. Let's just be careful not to say names. Um, but I want to show everybody some pictures and because this is another property damage kind of issue. This, this is this our happened, this happened three weeks after we settled Simmons. Yeah, yeah. So we said we do this one settlement. Um, we get the one point five million dollars, and then we're on another trial calendar for three weeks later, right? I mean, we're number we're, one. Yeah. Number four. Right. And uh, you know, here we are thinking that month that we're going to have two trials in a month, and it's going to be awesome. Um, in this case, uh, our client is the passenger vehicle, and she is hit. She is impacted. impacted. Yeah, that was the word we went with. She is impacted by a truck leading to this. Um, what struck me and, and probably strikes everybody here, um, and, and if it doesn't, you know, I'll, I'll mention it to you right now. Let me go back to this picture. Oh. Um, The problem here is that while the bumper is removed from the car um, and while there looks to be considerable damage, the problem is, is that it was more, it seems to have been more of a ripping or a pulling motion. Um, so if we look at the truck, the truck seems to have ripped or pulled the bumper, the rear bumper off, as opposed to causing an impact which provides force on the car. Um, that's what it looks like. You know, and, that, the, and the defense was saying it caught and grabbed it or something like that. No. Yeah, and I, we weren't necessarily challenging that. Um, I, I don't know how we could have. You know, is we, well, we did show that there was a we did show there was an impact right in here though. We we're able to show that, um, and there's some other pictures that like we think there's some impact in there. Um, and two, this is another example on the property damage estimate where they did have a line item for you know, putting it on the rack and straightening, straightening it back out. So, I mean, there's, there's body damage and it's not just cosmetic. And I mean, I think that's kind of, so we had, we had something to say in response to that, but it is a difficult mechanism of the collision. Yeah. We'll tell everybody about the injuries. Uh, so she ended up having, you know, neck pain, back pain primarily, and uh, a, uh, quote unquote mild traumatic brain injury uh, where uh, she sought care from a neurologist who's very good, very reputable, who diagnosed her with uh, post-concussion syndrome. And, um, you know, I think the, the primary injury really was, uh, you know, neck and back. Um, but one of the things I think that made this case even probably the most difficult, uh, but also created the opening for us for what we did was the fact that she had had a prior motor vehicle collision, a client, um, about a year before this uh, with neck and back injuries, treated for it. And uh, that was not reflected in the history of any provider she ever saw following our collision. Uh, and she'd also had some remote collisions. And by the time we got the case, she had had a subsequent collision nine months after this where she was rear-ended and went to the hospital with neck, back, and concussion symptoms also. Yeah, she was like so, a magnet for crashes. And there was no, there was only one mention in the medical records of the subsequent crash, and it was only to the physical therapist. And in there, she said, my lawyer said he's going to keep the second crash as part of the first one. So uh, lots. We, of, we were not the lawyers who said that, by the way. Yes, that was right. that, that was that was the but, that was the first lawyer. That was not us. Just to be clear. That's right. By the time we got the case, it was time to file a lawsuit. So this these were the facts we were given. 
So it was incredibly difficult, not just for property damage and mechanism, but also because I would say primarily because of recent in time prior and even subsequent collisions. And she ended up having um, a, uh, you know, we'll call it, you know, minimally invasive type uh, percutaneous type discectomy. Um, you know, I think they call them uh, D and D procedures. Um, yeah, a micro a micro discectomy. Micro, for, micro discectomy, yeah, but not a hundred. And, yeah. and her totals were about one hundred and fifty five thousand dollars, one hundred and fifty six thousand dollars. Right, not an open micro discectomy, but but uh, and that was on the low back. And then the doctor, the surgeon, orthopedic surgeon, had recommended a disc replacement in the cervical spine and then a fusion in the low back. So we had, you know, substantial future medicals, but it had been years since that was going on. I mean, we did have the positive fact that the doctor recommended those surgeries before the subsequent collision, and she had MRIs before the subsequent collision. So we had something to argue, uh, but, you know, very difficult. I mean, I, like I remember looking at this case right before trial and thinking, this case pretty much has every bad fact you could possibly imagine. Um, and, and, and when we talked about what the settlement value was, I think you, I think you have to necessarily talk about what the, what the range is that you can get a trial that you feel good about. And, you know, we thought that with this impact, a, a jury could easily say, here's your medical bills and $10,000. Here's your medical bills and $50,000. It, it seemed like, you know, the classic Mike Goldberg, just add a zero to it, multiply by 10. I, I, I say that. You know, not not to be sarcastic, I, I think that works in some scenarios. That was not going to work here. I mean, you know, asking the jury to award, you know, just just saying it and then, you know, the, the whole idea of the of multiplying by ten or or adding a zero is, you know, hey, it's obvious. You know, just add the add the zero. It, we didn't think this was obvious that this was just, oh yeah, obviously you add the ten here. No, and I think, you know, look, I mean, in any case, I mean, look, the plaintiff's credibility is the most important thing. I mean, really, that's the most important ingredient in most any case. And, uh, you know, in any case where a history is not accurate and it's repeated that way over multiple providers, you know, you've got a huge issue that you've got to deal with. And I think, you know, that's like catnip to defense lawyers. I mean, they look at that and they're like, okay, I mean, this one, you know, we're just going to hammer them on, you know, the fact that she wasn't truthful with her doctors. I think when you see that in your cases as a, you know, as a plaintiff's lawyer, look, you're responsible for rolling out this story of this plaintiff. And, you know, there are a couple of different ways you can deal with that. If you choose to ignore it and you just go and take the videotape depots of the doctors and none of them have an accurate history, you know, the defense lawyer doesn't really have to do anything. They get up in closing and they say, look, you know, the underlying facts on which these experts base their opinions are, you know, woefully deficient. I mean, you know, the most important thing is the fact she had these exact same symptoms less than a year before and she didn't tell them. And then the plaintiff's lawyer went and took the deposition of the doctor and he didn't tell him. He didn't show him the records and, you know, the plaintiff didn't tell him. And so even if the judge doesn't allow them to say the next thing, which is imagine what his opinion would have been had he known about those things, uh, the damage is already done. The plaintiff looks like a liar. The plaintiff's lawyer looks like a liar. And so I think in that situation, as a plaintiff's lawyer, you really, you're, you've then got to go get all the records, all the films, and you've got to be upfront and amend your answer interrogatories, disclose all those things. Yes, you're going to have an uncomfortable thing to deal with in the, in the deposition of the doctor where he says, I didn't know about those things and I don't know why she didn't tell me. Uh, but look, I mean, you know, I think that that's the way you send all that stuff to the treating doctor before you take his videotape deposition to find out if it's going to make a difference. Yeah, I remember on this case with the brain injury, with the neurologist after we sent all the records and and you know truly gave the neurologist everything that she could possibly need in order to make a, a, a real decision because or a, a valid decision determination because you know we didn't want we didn't want to set up a doctor to fail we don't want to set up a doctor who you know hey you give them you give them a section of records or you know only the information that they are told specifically but there's this wealth of information that they don't know and i remember that we didn't know what her answer was going to be you know, even until the deposit during the deposition, you didn't know exactly what the answer would be. I mean, you got it, but you know, 
walking in there, we weren't 100% sure and there was no way we could be. Yeah, I mean, the key for that was not, it was not that she, the, the plaintiff had had prior problems with that, but that the second subsequent collision, she went to the hospital saying that she was kind of dazed and confused, she hit her head. And uh, so, you know, the doctor didn't have those records until very close in time to the deposition. She, I, you know, I said to the, her office reached out to us and said, hey, we have everything. And I said, you need to, you know, there are records that you don't have. And if you need them from me, I can give them to you. But if you want to get them from the source, here's where you need to get them from. And so ultimately she was able to review them. And then, you know, I found out right before the deposition started, she's like, you know, this is pretty close. I mean, it's kind of a close call with those symptoms. Uh, but ultimately she said, look, I don't think that the second uh, incident was actually a concussion um, because normally having something like that would likely cause a dramatic worsening of the pre-existing problems of a mild traumatic brain injury, but she didn't have that on the subsequent visits. And so the next visit, when she returned, she actually was still sort of progressing in the same way that she previously described. And so she said, look, I, I think, you know, if anything, it was just temporary, but it was not something that was significant. So t t tell everybody about, um, about the magic language, the, the doctor's magic language for causation that you know, to a reasonable degree of medical certainty, I blah, blah, blah. Tell everybody about how you went about getting her opinion in a way that that sounded like it wasn't it, it was well first it wasn't that necessarily that magic language but second it was also in a way that made the doctor at least feel and made it seem to the doctor uh that it's not such a high of a burden that if you're reasonably certain to a, or you're reasonably certain to a you know a medical certainty that sounds that sounds so high tell, tell everybody what you did and what the law says so so the law actually in georgia distinguishes, you know, recognizes that there is a distinction between a reasonable degree of medical probability and a reasonable degree of medical certainty. And, uh, you know, medical certainty is something more than medical probability. Uh, and so doctors can certainly give opinions that are to within a reasonable degree of medical certainty, but that's not the, you know, the bar not for before. That's, disability. Yeah. Right. That's not what, that's not the minimum you have to prove in order to get that evidence to in front of a jury. That's it's right. great if the jury, if the judge, or if the judge, it's great if the doctor will say, yeah, it's to a reasonable degree of medical certainty, but you don't have to do that. That's right. And, you know, I mean, look, it sounds great, but I mean, I never ask uh, medical certainty just because look, you I know, mean, I think a lot of people do though. It's just a matter yeah. of course. I, I really yeah. do. I mean, look, our, our burden of proof is a preponderance, which is more likely than not, obviously. And so reasonable degree of medical probability, that's what that means. And doctors can be more certain or less certain, but it doesn't really matter. We, you know, that's the bar we need to clear. And so, you know, I don't, I don't like injecting other concepts of higher burdens and things like that into the case. I want to sort of keep it as simple as we can. So we're only explaining one burden, uh, especially when that's the one that we need. And so, you know, and also the case law says, look, doctors don't actually have to give their opinions to quote, within a reasonable degree of medical probability, it just says it has to be more than speculation. And so, you know, doctors sometimes I think don't really truly understand what that means, reasonable degree of medical probability. It just means more likely than not, if your education, training and experience as an expert in whatever your specialty is. And so, you know, you can, you can still, find out if, you know, in the deposition, if their opinion truly is that it's more likely than not that these symptoms are, you know, caused by the post-concussion syndrome suffered in this crash. And that's sufficient to get you to clear that obstacle and get that opinion to be admissible. Even if the doctor says, I'm not sure if it's a reasonable degree of medical probability, but I would say it's more likely than not. That's all you need. Yeah. So we're able to take, you know, the, this, this crash, which doesn't have you know, your traditional classic impact that you want, but we've got a client who had, you know, a, a minimally invasive surgery. Uh, we've got two estimates for, or two, two recommendations for future surgery, surgeries, which are major. On the other side, though, our client has not been regularly treating and had no interest in doing so. Um, and we've got a, a brain injury that we're ultimately able to tie to the crash but you and I are still concerned, I know, and I remember that we were, that the jury might still not believe 
that this impact could have caused all those things. And, and that was certainly still on our mind. Um, one thing, though, that was interesting here, and this was the last thing I guess we mentioned, is that it, we're in federal court for whatever reason, and we don't know the reason, the defense doesn't hire a single expert. Um, we don't know why. We don't know if it's just a missed deadline. It was told, uh, the, the defense lawyer eventually told me, you know, hey, this is so obvious, we don't need to hire an expert. And my response was, if it's so obvious, wouldn't you hire, wouldn't you hire an expert? Like, isn't, isn't it the opposite of that? Um, but I think by telling, and I remember in mediation, our opening statement, we said, look, you have no experts. You know, this could be a, you might be totally right, but you might also be totally wrong. You know, the safest thing for y'all to do is settle this case because you're just relying on, you know, the jury yeah, using common sense, if that's what, you know, that's going to be their position, but also they're going to have to, to ignore or disagree with all the expert medical testimony. I mean, they're, they're going to have to say, oh, okay, I don't believe any of that because the defense lawyer says so. And uh, would you tell everybody about how we planned to challenge the defense lawyer's ability? And we did a little bit in the motions in limine, but, you know, we were prepared to do it more at trial. How are you going to challenge the defense lawyer's ability to stand up in closing and just say what she thought based on no actual evidence and actually her her beliefs that's i'm gonna call it it is her beliefs work directly contrary to all the medical testimony that was to a reasonable degree of medical probability slash uh, more likely than not so because we were able to send the things that were missing to the treating doctors have them review it maybe not in as great a detail as I would have liked, but uh, review it. And then look, they ultimately said, look, it didn't make any difference in the course of treatment. Her treatment would have been the same no matter what. Um, the prior treatment didn't involve any imaging studies. It was soft tissue stuff. And so they said, look, that really doesn't affect any of the diagnoses from this crash. I really wish that she had told us about it, but ultimately it doesn't make any difference. So the, the we were then able to cut off that what the defense lawyer really planned to do with both experts and all the injuries, which is stand up in closing and say, you know, these experts didn't know the other facts of these other crashes, didn't know about the treatment, didn't know about the injuries. And so, you know, their opinions really are worthless. We were able to take that away from them. Then we had our expert opinions they were going to give. Now, jurors can still make the decision to completely disregard what the experts say. And look, if a plaintiff is impeached, they could make a decision to completely disregard what a plaintiff is saying and with respect to, oh, my neck and back were hurting too. But the key is that in a complex medical diagnosis, like a traumatic brain injury, only a doctor can diagnose that. And so a defense lawyer can't get up in closing and say, this traumatic brain injury isn't related to this crash, it's the subsequent one without an expert they to can't. say that. Yeah, they can't do that without a, a some sort of expert or other opinion to to contrast yeah, ours with. Yeah, I mean, lawyers, if they make arguments in closing an argument, it has to be based on a foundation of what's actually in evidence or inferences that could be drawn from the evidence. But they can't just get up and introduce a new causation theory that only the lawyer is the one espousing. I mean, if the lawyer is going to make that argument, they've got to retain the neurologist to look at all the evidence and say, look, you know, the traumatic brain injury to the extent there is one is from this other thing. If a lawyer is going to claim there is an alternative cause, they have the burden of proof. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so that we, we sort of had already cut off what they were wanting to do. By the time the videotape deposition of the treating neurologist rolled around, the defense lawyer realized, oh my gosh, they do know about all this stuff. And oh my gosh, it doesn't matter. And by then it was too late. They couldn't retain an expert. And the key is then you file a motion in limine, obviously right before trial. And look, one of the most important takeaways from this, I think that I can give to people is to say, Georgia has a really favorable statute on the burden of proof. And I think most judges, I, I shouldn't say that. I think some judges and most lawyers probably don't know how favorable it is for us. And that's uh, OCGA 24-14-1, burden of proof. And it says, the burden of proof generally lies upon the party who is asserting or affirming a fact and to the existence of whose case or defense, the proof of such fact is essential. 
if a negation or negative affirmation is essential to a party's case of defense, the proof of such negation or negative affirmation shall lie on the party so affirming it, which means if you're going to get up and say shit, you got to be able to prove it, right? Uh, that uh, trials are the place where we don't beat around the bush. We actually say what we mean and we put forth evidence to prove it. And so if you as a lawyer are going to take a position in some claim or defense that, you know, there's some fact that exists, that it's not enough to just get up and say, what about this? What about that? What about this? And try to create doubt that this statute means if they're going to take a position on a fact, they have the burden of proof to prove it. And there's one case that also, I think that I always cite in my motion to eliminate, that's great on this too. And in the site is 337 Georgia app 704. 337 Georgia app 704 Brown versus Tucker. And they basically explain exactly what the statute says, which is that when a defendant takes a position that 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 is more than just a simple denial. And so an affirmative defense is something that is more than, you know, just a denial. And so uh, at head note 16, a defendant need not necessarily concede the essential facts of the plaintiff's claim to raise a burden shifting affirmative defense. A defendant may deny the essential facts asserted and also claim in the alternative that if the plaintiff had been injured, the injury was due to causes other than the defendant's actions. And in that case, that is considered under the law a burden shifting affirmative defense, and they have the burden to prove it. And if they don't have the foundation for it, then you can move to exclude it. And the foundation being a medical expert who's going to say more likely than not that this was caused by this, these injuries were caused by something else, then you can move to exclude all of that, all the arguments, everything. Uh, and so I think you get into a closer call when you're just talking about back and neck injuries because a plaintiff can testify to those things. You don't really need an expert. Uh, so I think, you know, that's kind of a closer call, but I, but with a complex medical diagnosis, there's no question that if they're going to raise, you know, they're going to raise some other cause as being the cause of those symptoms, they've got to have an expert. And if they don't, then they haven't met their burden of proof and you can get it excluded on motion and eliminate or, you know, directed verdict. I mean, I think the risk of a directed verdict is it's in, and if the judge doesn't grant it, then you may have a real issue. Uh, so I would always move to head that off with the motion of limine. All right. And then we went to mediation, able to sell this case pretty quickly, frankly, at the, yeah. for mediation time for the million dollars. Um, you know, no, no great story there. We, you know, felt like million dollars. We, we, we were going, we, our goal walking in there was to, was to try and see if we could get a seven figure number. Um, and you know, that was where our line was and we we're able to, um, but I, I do think that the biggest takeaway from this is, uh, is one, make sure the two biggest takeaways are one, make sure that your expert doctors, your treating physicians have everything they need and are not going to be surprised. So give them the records from Dr. A, Dr. B, Dr. C, and let them review them. That may turn that, that treating pro provider from a treating provider to an expert witness to a there's there there's kind of this in between gray area so you may need to be a little more careful with your disclosures and disclose that the doctor has seen records other than their own and that they have you know given a, an opinion that um that takes all these other records in, into a into account and then you know second be careful uh, be mindful of lawyers just making stuff up you know, lawyers can't just stand up in closing and say, at least for certain things, at least they can't stand up and just say, no, that brain injury was not the result of that crash. It was from this other crash. That's an expert opinion. But Alan, but like Alan did say, the general rule is, and a good way of thinking about it, is if your client can testify that, yeah, the crash hurt my back, then the defense lawyer can probably stand up and say the crash didn't hurt that person's back. But your client can't say, I got a brain injury from the crash because you need expert opinion on that. Um, and so then the defense lawyer can't because the defense lawyer is not an expert, just like your client isn't an expert. So those are our takeaways. But Alan, gracias. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Mike. I'm going to kick you out here and then we'll thank wrap you, up with everybody. Um, let's see. Goodbye, Alan. Maybe. There we go. All right. Uh, the last... 
thing that I last two things I want to talk about very briefly. Number one is the uh, is the podcast betrayal and how our case relates to it. Um, for the last six or seven weeks or so, betrayal the podcast has been number one or number two in the nation on Apple Podcasts. Um, it's a story about a um, it's told from a wife's perspective who essentially she comes home from work one day and her husband is sitting in the middle of the living room on the couch and saying to her, it's over, it's over, it's all over. Um, she then sees that there was a search warrant on the table and that search warrant mentions a student. Her husband is a Kell High School teacher, teacher of the year twice, in fact, um, and he engaged in a um, sexual I, the word isn't relationship. Um, he had uh, sex and other, um, I, I'm struggling on relationship, but it's relationship in the sense that a, a 16, 15, 16, 17 year old can be in a relationship, which um, it, with a 40 year old teacher, a person of power, but our client um, and, and this teacher over a course of a couple of years um, were we're having you know, sexual interactions. Um, the, the reason that we say this all happened was because uh, the Cobb County School allowed, allowed the teacher, his name is Spencer Heron, allowed Spencer Heron to create a, a club, an unauthorized club at the school that later died out, but he used the idea of the club um, to continue to sexually assault our client over and over and over repeatedly. Um, she eventually told her parents and uh, Chris Stokes and, and I from my office, we got involved um, and we've been working on this case now for about four years. Our client is now a college graduate. I was a reference for her to get her first job out of school um, and uh, we're really proud of her and, and she's done an, an incredible job given all the things going on. Uh, but the story, at least told from Spencer Heron's wife, uh, has been uh, made into a podcast, and it's called Betrayal. And for some additional context, what, what everybody's kind of learned is that Heron had, you know, countless affairs over the years um, from friends and, and other people uh, to strangers and, and, and so on. Um, it's a really interesting podcast. Our client is actually interviewed. Um, she's interviewed on episode three, and she is pretty much the bulk of episode three. She's interviewed by Heron's wife. She's interviewed by Heron's wife, and we are extremely proud of her. Um, she does an incredible job and has uh, has perspective and a worldly view on things that you don't expect most 22-year-olds to have. Um, so we're really, really proud of her. Uh, worth mentioning, I am interviewed in episode four. Uh, where we talk about the legal aspects of the case and, and some other things. So check that out if you haven't already. Uh, it is easy to find. It's betrayal. And it's right now, I think, number two on the Apple podcast. The last thing I want to talk about and, and mention to y'all is, is something that's been on my mind, certainly for the last week or two. And it's something that uh, that may ruffle some feathers. I don't know. It may may bother some people. But uh, at this point, I, I don't really care. Um, I think it's important for, for me to say what's on my mind, like I usually do at the end of these podcasts. Um, but I want to start by telling you a little bit of a story and um, then tell you what I really think about, about an issue that's uh, really important to me and hopefully is important to some of you. So I have a case with a lawyer um, who every time I talk to him uh, about what's going on or an issue in the case, he says, well, I've been a lawyer for 30 years. And then he goes on generally to say something that makes absolutely no sense. Um, so, you know, he'll say, I'm, I, well, I've been a lawyer for 30 years and this is how I've always done it. And it just, it makes no sense to do it that way. So eventually, eventually I said to him, I don't care. I don't care how long you've been a lawyer. I don't care if this is the way you've always done it. It just doesn't make sense. And that is how I feel about this gun control stuff. We can't change laws because that's the way it's always been. Well, I don't care. I don't accept that. And I will not accept that. And I hope you don't either. More guns are killing kids than cars. But every year as cars get safer, mass shootings rise. 
There have been more mass shootings this year than days in the year. My firm currently represents 42 families who have had their loved ones killed by guns. And over the years, we've represented hundreds of families who have had um, their loved ones killed by guns or represented people who have been victims of gun crimes. Mental health in the United States is not the problem. It is a problem, but it's not the problem. The US is not more mentally unstable than other countries. Hate is not the problem. Hate is a problem, but it's not the problem. We do not have more hate here than other places. The problem is that people who are unstable and hate have access to weapons of war. That's what AR-15s are, and that's what guns like them are. They are guns and weapons of war. That is why we have a security officer at a, that's why having a security officer at a school will not work. He will be overmatched about, uh, against the weapons of war that mass shooters have. Teachers can't get money for classroom materials, for books, markers, pencils, but we wanna fortify schools and arm teachers. We don't trust teachers to use their discretion to teach about topics um, that may be uncomfortable or sensitive for some people, especially in the LGBTQ context. Um, we don't wanna allow teachers to have discretion to talk with students who are going through things, but we wanna allow them the discretion to decide to shoot a weapon inside of a school. But schools aren't the only problem. It's churches, grocery stores, malls, bars, everywhere. Everywhere, apparently, is the problem. And the one thing that all of these mass shootings have in common is that they involve a weapon of war. We need to fight this war by disarming the combatants, by taking away the guns. If you are someone who says that you have a constitutional right to a gun, first, I don't think you actually do. The Second Amendment says that you must be part of a well-regulated, well-regulated militia. If you're involved in a militia nowadays, then you're most likely a domestic terrorist or a crazy guy living in your backyard, crawling around, pretending like you're, you know, I don't know, on, in SEAL Team 6. Second, even if you do have a constitutional right to a gun, who cares? When the Constitution, or excuse me, when the Second Amendment was written and ratified, the gun of war, the weapon of choice, was a musket. At that time, it took somewhere between one to two minutes to reload a musket. The idea that you could shoot over and over and over in a small period of time was not even a thought on anyone's mind. And just because it's always been that way doesn't mean that it has to be that way in the future. If you're someone who says, well, you want a gun, it's fun to have one. Well, it's not fun for those families. It's not fun for police who are out there defending us. And your fun is not worth people dying. When the Constitution was written, slaves, minorities, women, and even white non-landowners, they didn't have the same rights as we all do now. We do not have to live like this anymore. We do not have to live under the writings of people hundreds of years ago who lived in a very different world than what we live in today. I've gotten messages uh, about some of my social media posts lately where I've, I've tried to share uh, information about gun crimes. Um, this weekend, for example, there was, uh, I, by, by last count, there was 11, 11 mass shootings in our country just this weekend from Friday to Sunday. And I've gotten messages from people saying that, you know, now is not the time for politics and how dare you talk about this. It's the time for mourning, the time for thoughts and prayers. Well, if we never make changes, we will always be in mourning and we will always be giving our thoughts and prayers. I don't know what to do. Um, I really don't. I, I don't know the answer to this. I've talked to a lot of friends um, and, and collectively, my circle of, of people, we don't know what to do. Um, I know that I will not give any money to candidates that do not support sweeping gun control and taking weapons of war off the street. That's one thing I think we can all do. Um, you know, it's a really tough thing to balance. Do you want to try to make incremental change, you know, reinstituting an assault weapons ban or banning, um, you know, a certain bump stock? Is that what we want to do? Do we want to raise the minimum age for a long rifle, which includes an AR-15 from 18 to 21? Handguns right now you can't get if you're below 21. Um, I don't know if you want to do that or if you want sweeping major gun reform. Um, I don't have an answer, but I want to hear from y'all. So if you're listening um, and if you hear this and if you have any thoughts or ideas, uh, please share them with me because I'd love to be able to figure out a way that we can do something um, because 
it's a problem that has been going on for the entire time, at least I've been alive. I mean, I, for the most part, I remember Columbine. And then, um, you know, the idea that children are going through active shooter drills right now where, you know, they're taught to you know, be as quiet as possible so they don't get shot and killed. Um, that's just pretty ridiculous. And the idea that, um, that we have to live like this, I won't accept that just because it's always been that way, at least recently, doesn't mean it has to be. So, you know, help me out, um, help the world out, help everybody out, and let's come up with a way or ways, ideas of what we can do. Um, if you disagree with me and you think that, you know, I'm completely off base and wrong, I've had people who have messaged me and say, I'll never send you a case again because of what you're putting out there about, you know, uh, guns and gun control. Uh, I, I don't care. I don't care. I'd rather have less cases and less children dying. So um, if, if you've got a different opinion, that's fine. That's completely fine. But I hope we can all agree that, um, that protecting people is worth more than, uh, than the fun of having a gun. So uh, sorry to, to take you all on that. I'm not really sorry, but um, forgive me, I guess, to some degree for taking you down that road. But it's been on my mind and I wanted to share it. Uh, right or wrong, I feel better, at least now that I said it, and I hope you continue to have, or you, if you're not already, I hope you have these conversations with, you know, your circle of friends, um, because it is something that we need to, to change and fix. Um, kids should be able to go to school safe. People should be able to go to the grocery store or church and be safe. Um, gun violence should not be an everyday occurrence, and it doesn't have to be. You know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. We've done the same thing over and over for, you know, a couple decades now. Um, it's time we do something different. And I think if you compare the, the data from other countries who do something differently, I mean, look at Canada, for example, who, who has taken drastic action even uh, after a shooting in our country um, to prevent it happening in theirs. Uh, if you compare that data, there are things that we can do that we're not doing and things that will make a big difference. You know, we do not have to be the leader in gun violence. So anyway, y'all have a, a good week. Um, I hope everybody stays safe. Uh, and if you have ideas, I'd love to hear them. See you, everybody.